Hey guys, Jason Shellcross of the Fantasy Football Sackos here, welcoming you to another episode of the podcast. Uh huh. Alex and I have a great episode lined up for you today. We're going to be talking about top wide receivers this season. Um, it's going to get a little ridiculous after the, about the first four or five picks. Stay with us. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Sackos podcast with your hosts, Jason Shalcross and Alex Krog. Let's go! Fantasy Football Sackos back again. Special late night edition. <laughs> Uh, Alex, how we doing? As always, uh, Jason Shellcross here, Alex Krogh. Alex, how we doing, buddy? How was your weekend? Weekend was good. I think. I don't really remember. I feel like every day's a, I feel like every day's a weekend at this point. Why is that? When you're working from home, you can never get away from work. Oh. So even, so even when you're not working, it feels like you are working. And when you gotcha. are working, sometimes it feels like you're not working. Well, for all of our listeners, including myself, who don't work at home currently, the weekend felt great. It was it was a nice little respite for myself. That's good. I, the weekend was fine. Yeah. It's the weekend. It's, it's the middle of summer. I, like me personally, I'm just excited for my kid to get here in a month. So it's just taking forever for time to pass. And you have a name a all picked out? We have, yeah, we don't know what the sex is. We do have two different names picked out, one for boy, one for girl. It's an exciting time. That's amazing. And you had your last and final uh, baby shower today? That, that was today. That's correct. I believe it was our sixth or eighth <laughs> baby shower we've had remotely. <laughs> it's been a lot. Oh, man. Well, but the, I, I would actually gotta encourage, include everybody, right? Yeah, all things considered, I actually think it was a really good idea because it was smaller groups of people. So you could talk more to those people instead That's of nice. what usually happens when you get like 600, not obviously an exaggeration, but if you get like 40 or 50 people up in the same roof, you can't really talk to everybody and it goes no. by really quickly. So it, it's nice to take your time, talk to people, enjoy the process more than anything. Very nice. Yeah. Um, well, we do have a little bit of news going on we the do. last couple of days. Um, There's news. So, Mr. Ezekiel Elliott, obviously, as you know, has COVID, uh, has been instructed per his doctor to not practice or work out or anything at this time. So, uh, tell me what you think about that. Sounds like I might move Michael Thomas up to third overall instead of fourth overall on my <laughs> rankings. <laughs> well, there is, you know, a contingency of people that are saying, well, p you know, players should just get sick now. So that way they get sick and theoretically have antibodies in those things. But who knows how long until they can even work out again, you know? And, and yeah, so I, yeah, that face kind of <laughs> says it all. Like if you if if somebody gets it during the season, who knows how long they'll be out for? So, yeah, we made mention of this before about what do you do with IR spots. But if that's the case, and I don't know what league settings are depending on what website you're on, but doesn't it almost make sense that you should have unlimited IR spots if people have COVID? Because if you have, you know, if if you get hit with two or three people, and you only have one IR slot, you're kind of screwed. You're not going to drop them. So yeah, maybe and, maybe you somehow figure out how to have like special waivers or, or some sort of thing where, hey, you can drop this guy and you still have like bird rights to him to a certain extent where you can go grab him back without having to keep him on your roster. But that, that complicates everything, obviously. Yeah, well, it's going to be a mess, though, too, if it hits a star like Zeke in the middle of the season, because then it's going to be like people are going to be just blowing their fab for the backup. If it's yeah, they they won't be saving their sauce. No, there will not. There will be no sauce for nuggets. If uh, if some if a couple superstars <laughs> go down with COVID, but I mean, who knows how long people will be out for? Or is it like 
Is it like a special circumstance where if your superstar gets COVID, you have the ability to pick up the backup before anybody else does? Because it's a special circumstance that would not be in place were it not for a global pandemic. So, unless that person's already rostered, you can't do that though either. So you're stuck. Yeah, it it's gonna be be interesting. It'll be interesting. Thoughts and prayers to uh, all of our commissioners out there having to deal with this this year in some form or fashion. Right. And that doesn't even include people threatening to quit your league just because of bad trades. So it's <laughs> it, you're, there's going to be a lot of <laughs> there's going to be a lot of things you have to put up with this year. You Sorry, would not guys. know anything about that. <laughs> oh, man. All right. That's a uh, little news nugget number one and news nugget number two. Our boy, Cam Newton. Officially a Patriot. I don't know if he's our boy or not. He's my he's boy. Guy. I love Cam. Why? That thing is good at football when healthy. Oh, really? I mean, he was the MVP 2015. Yeah. I don't know if he's any better than Sidham is. I, I have no confidence in his ability to pass the ball. His career pass ratings under 60%. So I think Tom Brady, hold on, let me just compare this real quick. Tom Brady has had, um, let's see here, uh, you know, zero seasons under 60% from a completion percentage standpoint in his entire career. So I'm going to go with he's not that good of a quarterback. He, He can run the ball, but from a passing perspective, it doesn't really help the value of Edelman or Heel Harry or any of any of the other Patriots skill position players. He's if anything, it might actually help James White if they're gonna run more of like option type things and he would fit more of a Christian McCaffrey role than Sony Michelle does. Otherwise, I think honestly, it's more of just a distraction because the Patriots got slapped with a fine and a draft pick hit. And so people are gonna be talking about them signing signing Cam Newton instead of potentially getting caught cheating again. Do you think maybe that's why they signed him like the same weekend that the $1.1 million fine and third round draft prick penalty <laughs> was announced to change the news a little bit? Bill, Bill Belichick is not an idiot. And yes, there's without a doubt no reason why he did not do that. He, that's, that's the only reason why. Well, not the only reason that he signed Cam, but it, it's all incentives. And so. Maybe Cam does more than I think he can, but I don't think anybody's seen him throw a football in a couple of years. Uh, he was not healthy last year when he was on the field. I I don't think he's a top 25 quarterback anymore because of the wear and tear that he's taken with, with running the ball. If, we'll anything, if anything, he's more of like a similar, and this, this is going to sound so disrespectful, it already does. <laughs> I know. I... He was an MVP of the league. I know. And I you make know. him sound like a hot pile of garbage. I know. Please continue your disrespectful no. statement. You have to yeah, for it, the people. Yeah, no, I know. And this this is gonna be worse than you saying that the Broncos have a top ten position uh position player repertoire. They do. Uh, no, they don't. I was going to compare him to Taysom Hill, honestly. Oh! And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I stopped. Better stats. See- rest of their career. Cam Newton or Taysom Hill? Because <laughs> Taysom's taking over next season. Yeah. Wow, I'm, I'm that gonna, is a hot I'm take. Just gonna, I'll, I'll say Taysom Hill, just for the hell of it. Whatever. <laughs> What's in your glass tonight? <laughs> Everclear, apparently. Everclear, Not a sponsor. Kids don't drink alcohol. <laughs> or you turn out like this. Oh, Be careful. Yeah, red haired and bushy tailed and full of sass. Wow, bad. Bad comparison. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, sure, I'll take Taysom Hill. There's you know what's not a bad comparison? You, you looking like a skinny Chris Kringle right now. Wow. <laughs> that hurts. It, it's like 
do you shower and condition just for the podcast? I swear to God, your hair looks fluffier every fluffier and fluffier every time I see you, and your beard is all beautiful. I have no comment on those accusations. <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right, let's talk. So today Hi. we are talking wide receiver ones, top 12 wide receivers this upcoming season, half point PPR scoring. Um it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. There's gonna be some fun discussion. We're pretty much consensus in like the first like three or four guys, but everybody is. So it's really pretty much the top twelve, actually. We're we're very similar throughout, and it does not match what quote unquote industry experts would be saying from their rankings perspective. So I'm, I'm ready to kind of dive into it and, and give some reasons why we feel certain ways. I will also say that in order to look forward, we should look backwards real quick. Uh, in research that I've done, uh, it makes sense. Targets would be the most important opportunity. If, if you have more opportunity to have more catches and yards and touchdowns, then you're probably going to be more successful. So in 2018, if you were the top 12 of targets, 11 of the top, or sorry, if you were top 12 in targets, you were a top 12 wide receiver with almost 100% accuracy. There's only one player that did not, or that had top 12 targets that did not finish in the top 12, and that player was number 19 ranked overall as a wide receiver. Now, if you were in the top 24 of targets in 2018, 20 of the 24 top target players were in were wider were at least wide receiver twos. So it makes sense that if you have the most targets, you're going to be a top wide receiver. So we're trying to figure out who is going to have the most targets. Did that hold true in 2019? Maybe, maybe not. So if you were in the top 12 of targets, so if you were a wide receiver one from a target perspective, seven of those top 12 target people finished as a wide receiver one. Now, if you were in the top 24, 22 of the 24 top wide receivers were in the top 24 of targets. So if you get the top targeted players, you're basically setting yourself up for a very high floor is what targets would tell you. So let's try to figure out who's going to have the most targets. You know, when you, I think it's always good to encourage people to do their own research. Take your scoring from last year, sort by targets, and that would not be a terrible list to go off of to try to determine what your rankings are to be a top top wide receiver. Yeah, and that you know very much leads into our number one overall wide receiver, Michael Thomas, led the league in targets, had an absolutely obscene 185 of them uh, last year, uh, almost 150 receptions, more than 1,700 yards and nine touchdowns uh he only had two single point games all season uh sean payton drew Brees, that offense runs through michael thomas um it he had an incredible season and i think so he's disgusting gonna have, he's gonna have another incredible season for as long as drew Brees is his quarterback uh, i i don't really question his ability to finish as wide receiver one and even if Drew Brees does get hurt, he has the best backup of all time, which is Taysom Hill. <laughs> did that hurt coming out? Yeah, it really did. <laughs> I was like, I, you started there and I was like, wait, no, Bridgewater's not there anymore. What are you talking about? And then you're just all chips in the middle on Taysom Hill. Just so, no. so gross. But, right, so Teddy Bridgewater isn't there anymore. Jameis Winston is. So even if Breeze gets hurt, he still has Jameis, who is obviously more than capable as a backup quarterback. More than capable as a backup. I don't know if he's going to be able to touch that Bridgewater-Breeze uh, completion percentage, though. But we'll see. Yeah, he doesn't oh. have to. Yeah. Right, Mike, Michael Thomas had 70 more points in a half PPR uh league than number two wide receiver last year so about two two more points a game uh on average two more points a game than than the next best uh wide receiver which is chris godwin who missed a couple games at the end of the season so yeah michael thomas he has to be the number one wide receiver whether he'll finish there or not i don't know but it makes sense to take him he has the he has such a high floor because of the targets because of the reception because of the yards He's pretty much the undisputed number one wide receiver. 
if you were to take somebody else, you'd have to really figure out how to get around his production from last year, especially in that offense where he's, you know, not necessarily running deep routes all the time. He is a possession receiver, but he also has the the burners to go by everybody too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, moving on. Wide receiver to consensus. Tyreek Hill. So Tyreek Hill was the number 30 wide receiver last year. Oh yeah, was, baby. Count me in for number two. Yeah, he was the third 30 overall wide receiver last year. He third the 38th most receptions in football. He was 43rd in targets, 31st in total yards, and he had seven touchdowns, which is tied for 13th. But he he was hurt a couple couple uh games last year. Patrick Mahomes is back all year. So a combination of Tyreek Hill hurting his hamstring, Patrick Mahomes not being 100% for a good portion uh, of the regular season last year. Tyreek Hill, he was number one in 2018 from a wide receiver perspective. So he has the ability, clearly, clearly has the ceiling to be a number one, number two wide receiver. He's already done it before. No doubt. He he is the most explosive wide receiver in football, playing with the best quarterback in football, with the best offensive coach in football. And so it's really hard to not want him to be the best wide receiver in football. His issue is more so not having those targets, because even when he was the number one wide receiver in 2018, he was doing it and he didn't have that target share. Yep. So he so he's doing it on straight up explosiveness. Uh, so in 2018, he had the 11th most targets in football, which was 137. Julio had 170 that year. Uh, as a point of reference, Michael Thomas had 185 last year, which is still incredible. Uh, so he's a home run hitter. He might not be as consistent as some of the other people, but the excitement that he brings to watch him bust a run, you know, he can go from behind the line of scrimmage to being 40 yards downfield in, in four seconds. And there's nobody within five or six yards of him. So he's one of those guys where yes, he has the potential to do it, but he's more importantly, he's already shown that he can do it. That's why we, have, that's why at least I have him at number two. And, and so do you. Yeah. We both have him at number two. Um, like you said, he missed some, in, some time with injury last year. Uh, I would like to talk about his stats of the games that he was in projected over a 16-game season. So he did miss time. He finished with 89 targets. His rate over a season or projected for a season would have been 142 targets. His 58 receptions over a 16-game season would have been good for 93 receptions. His 860 yards over a season would have been just under 1,400 yards. He had seven touchdowns. He finished only two touchdowns behind Michael Thomas with 100 less targets. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) The guy scores touchdowns. That's what Tyreek Hill does. And over a 16-game season, he would have averaged just over 11 touchdowns. If he can stay healthy, the man's going to be in double-digit touchdowns. It's a super high-powered offense. You have probably what I think is the best quarterback in the league throwing you the ball and a top-three head coach. Like, the guy's a surefire wide receiver one, easily in the top three in my mind, especially in athletic ability. As long as his off-the-field issues stay uh, non-existent off the, off the field. Yeah. And don't affect him uh, on the field. Then, uh, then I think he's easily a top three wide receiver in fantasy points. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's no reason why he shouldn't be the number two guy. I will mention currently, uh, for ESPN, because I think it's always interesting to compare it to at least their, their PPR positional charts. Even yeah, we should keep we're doing that for these guys. Yeah, we're so, you know, you and me, we're generally talking about half PPR, just again, for clarification for the listeners. Yeah. But currently, uh, he has ranked the fifth wide receiver on ESPN going 10 overall. Uh, me and Jason both like him to be number two. Who are the, the other four guys, guys will, ahead of him? Uh, in order, they have Michael Thomas, 
Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, and Julio Jones ahead of him. Gross. Okay. Um, consensus number three, Julio Jones. So he, he was number three overall wide receiver last year, fifth in receptions, second in yards, second in targets. He only had six touchdowns. He's never been a big touchdown guy. Though, that which is, is really the ins- most frustrating part about Julio freaking Jones as a serial Julio owner. I get him. I feel like I just end up with Julio every year, every other year. He, the man just, he's so beautiful to look at. He's so tall and just like, if you were building a wide receiver, you would say, make him look like that. Make him look he's like Julio Jones. Yep. He's easily the prototype wide receiver. Like, they just don't get him the damn ball. <laughs> he, he, not, not enough in the, in the red zone. I mean, six touchdowns. I don't think that that's really ever going to change, unfortunately. I just, I, I don't know. I, I, would be, I would be surprised if he hits double-digit touchdowns. But, yeah, I mean... 157 targets, second uh, behind Michael Thomas last year. Great offense. Um, and from uh, from a passing perspective, they can't really run the ball a whole lot, but not early, maybe. There you go. All, All right. right, my my thing with Julio is he has such a high floor again since 2014. So we're talking the last six years. Jason, if you'd like to guess, how many seasons has he had under 1,400 receiving yards? 1,400 is a oh, big number. Oh, that's quite the bar. It's a big number. Since, since 2014, how many seasons has he had under 1,400 yards receiving? Okay, well, last season he finished with 1,395, so I know that that's at least one. <laughs> that counts. So there's yeah, you're talking that's, that's the only season that he's finished under 1400 yards. And it was by 6 yards. He finished with 1394. Yeah, that's the only season that okay. he's finished. So that that floor is so high and I feel like yeah. people people forget how good he is because I feel like everybody's had him on their team at some point. He doesn't score touchdowns, but he's going to get like 10 receptions for 95 yards and you're going to be sitting there and you're going to be like, man, he was fine this week. He got me 15 points. That's exactly what I felt like. I was like, oh, all right, great. That's 10 to 15 points. Like, and but then it's every, t- like he'll have it every single week though, yeah, which is, the, which is yeah. really important. And then you see Tyree kill go off for like 30. You're like, oh, why did I draft him over Tyreek? Yeah, the wide receiver envy is real whenever you have Julio Jones on your team. Yeah. Be- because of that touchdowns. He's only had one double digit touchdown year in his career. Don't you think he's almost due for one? You know, he if, could if be. you know, if if Austin, you know, Austin Hooper's not there anymore, Aiden Hurst might, you know, replace him just fine. Calvin Ridley had seven touchdowns last year. I was again. like, the issue is Calvin Ridley, man. Right, like, uh, right. I mean, Julio had six, Calvin Ridley had seven. That's just inexcusable. Like, come on, Matt Ryan, throw him the ball. Yeah, absolutely. His Julio Jones's average season since 2014 is 104 catches, 1,565 yards, and six touchdowns. How do you run for almost 1,600 yards and only get Five touchdowns? Six. Six touchdowns. <laughs> it's, all, it's criminally low. Right. So so that over 16 weeks a season, let's just assume he, he played all. I'm sure he missed a couple games in there. But that average is to be 14 points a week. And that's what he'll get you like every week. There, there will be somewhere he'll get like 21, but then he might pop off like a 10, 10, 10, you know, to bring it back down to 14. Uh, he's He's still really good. He is the all-time leader in uh, receiving yards per game in NFL history, which is 96 yards a game. Michael Thomas happens to be the second highest in NFL history, which is 87 yards. So he's, he's about nine yards a game lower than Julio Jones is in his career. Dude's clearly a Hall of Famer. Yeah. He, that, that, I have him at three because of that high floor. Yeah. Very high floor. I and mean, if we want to talk a little bit more about that whole consistency from a week to week thing, uh, we can look at these last three wide receivers 
Um, Michael Thomas only had two single point games last year, half PPR scoring. Tyreek had four single point games, although Tyreek did get injured and miss some time there. So it, over a 16 game season, it would have been more than that. Yep. Uh, Julio had five single point games, but they were mostly at like eight or nine points. So, yeah, right. uh, e- ESPN has Julio at number f- at their fourth ranked wide receiver going nine overall. Uh, again, their order is Michael Thomas, Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones, Tyree Kill as their first five. Gotcha. Hmm. Our consensus number four, Devontae Adams. I have him at three. And you have him at five. So if if anybody's been listening to us over uh, I knew, what is this I ep- just, ep- I episode, knew. yeah, yeah, I, I have to bust your balls a little bit. So this is what, episode nine? It was uh, the running backs. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is episode nine. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and Jason is saying, yeah, Devontae Adams, who's only had over a thousand yards one time, he failed to mention that he had 997 yards two other seasons. Hey, no. Uh, but hey, I'm just whatever spitting it is, facts. You are, but whatever it is to, uh, once again, a disclaimer before, you can always use facts to make your case one way or the other. And guess what? After Jason saying that uh, Devontae Adams is uh, quite overrated, and then he actually, you know, did some research, he found out that Devontae Adams is, is in fact, not overrated. Just, just to give you, be, <laughs> just to, before I kick this back over to Jason, uh, last year was the 24th overall wide receiver, 13th in receptions, 26th in yards, 13th in targets. He had five touchdowns, which is tied for 36th among wide receivers. Again, 24th overall, 13 in catches, 13th in targets, and he missed four weeks, I believe. Unbelievable that he was able to get up that high while missing four weeks. Yeah, so that's what I want to talk about. Um, look. I don't think say are are you going to apologize and say you were wrong? I am not going to apologize because I never apologize and I'm also <laughs> never wrong. Like, yeah, you, that's I mean, not it's a thing. Yeah, technically now, you weren't wrong. Yeah, that's true. This is what I have to say about Devontae Adams. Is Devontae Adams a top three or top five wide receiver in skill? No. Is he the only decent wide receiver? Decent wide receiver? On a good football team that has like no other offensive weapons other than a running back. Yes. He's the only guy Aaron Rodgers throws the football to, which is why over a 16 game season, if you take out his injuries or if you take out his missed games because of injury and you spread those stats over 16 games, he, he would have had almost 170 targets, 110 catches, just over 1,300 yards and seven touchdowns. So, like, the volume is crazy because Aaron Rodgers doesn't have anybody else to throw to. <laughs> yeah, can, just, just as a... Uh, so you, you're extrapolating numbers, but I can actually give you what he did in 2018 when he was the number three overall wide receiver, which was... Okay, different coach, different offense, though. No, I, I know, but still... The, very similar position players around him where he's literally their only guy. Yes, but and they also threw the ball more as a percentage of their plays run. Okay, but again, 111 catches, 13, close to 1,400 yards, 13 touchdowns, and 170 targets. Those targets are very similar, except yeah. over 16-game season. And again, that creates the high floor because of the target value. Yep. And he finishes what? Wide receiver three that year? Correct. Yeah. I and hey, I have him ranked at wide receiver three. So go me. Wow. Uh, I I would direct you to so. Yeah, just I I wish I had flip flops to hold up and on on the screen right now just to show you what you're doing. One one thing I would suggest doing because I I can't read directly off of ESPN's website, but it's, it's really good. Um, you know, he's, he's the number two wide receiver during the 12 weeks with, that he was active last year. So he is still the guy he's getting 30% of the targets in their offense. He was number three, a couple of years ago, 
We have him at, at four this year. There's no reason why he shouldn't finish there. And again, you know, ESPN has him as their second best wide receiver. You know, all these guys are pretty close. We have him there as well. He's good. He's really good. Yep, absolutely. I'm taking I'm taking any of these guys so far over like the Joe Mixon end of round one running backs. Like I am taking some of these guys instead. Uh, consensus number five, DeAndre Hopkins. This is going to be a toss up where to, you know, do you believe in that offense with him getting traded to Arizona as a, as a quick refresher for last year is the fifth overall wide receiver, second in receptions, 10th in yards, fifth in targets, seven touchdowns, which is tied for 13th among wide receivers. He's been a top five guy for the last couple of years. Uh, 2018, he finished number two. Last year, he finished number five. We have him at five this year. It ultimately comes down to, do you think Kyler Murray is going to be able to get him the ball in that offense? You know, when you're dropping from Watson to Kyler Murray, is there that substantial fall off? It's only a second year in the league. Will they be able to design plays to get him the ball? He of the top five, even though I shouldn't have question marks, I do have question marks about him just because of, of switching teams and making sure that because you want to guarantee that that production stays there with uh, with Larry Fitzgerald being there and Christian Kirk being there. And just is there the ball enough to go around by the time you're mixing in a, a heavy dose of Kenyon Drake? Potentially, his production does fall a little bit, but he could be more efficient uh, with less opportunities. Yes. Yeah. Well, I uh, I think he's actually going to be helping out Kyler Murray a lot more than his current receivers are. Um, we talked about Kyler Murray led the league in sacks credited to a quarterback last year. Just didn't get as much help from his wide receivers after plays break down. And I think... Uh, DeAndre is going to help with that this this season. Um, I'm looking for DeAndre to have a big year, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he finished higher than that. It's just the whole new team aspect. I think we have him down at number five. Um, consensus number six, Kenny Galladay. This is uh, terrifying. All yeah. right, so he, he, he was six overall last year, 29th in receptions, sixth in yards, 20th in targets, and he had 11 touchdowns, which is the first in the NFL. So there's going to be theoretically touchdown regression, unless there isn't touchdown regression. See, like, you look at the stats, and if you played against him last season, like, he had a very, very, very good year. But then you actually get into it, and you see that he only had 116 targets and 65 catches. And you're like, how did he have the season that he had? <laughs> yeah, how, I'll did, tell how you, did he finish at six? It's 11 touchdowns. <laughs> that's, yeah. what, that's how you do it. So let's, let's talk about Mr. Matt Stafford getting hurt. And let's talk, talk about what Kenny G's stats were during the first eight games while he had Stafford throwing him the ball. Kenny G. Uh, in his first eight games, he had 62 targets, 35 catches, 640 yards, seven of his 11 touchdowns in the first eight games. And he only had two single point games. As a 16 game season, that comes out to 124 targets, 70 catches, 1300 yards, and 14 touchdowns. <laughs> like his play obviously went down in the second half of the season and he missed Matt Stafford. He still had a very good year and still obviously continued to make uh, huge plays, but I think we'll benefit from having Stafford back, hopefully for a full season. Um, I believe you said that Stafford has really only missed significant time this year. Yeah, so he played 16 games every year since 2011, other than wow. last year, which is the, so remarkably consistent. I know it seems like he's always at least a little bit banged up, but he's played every single game for, for nine years or eight years before last year. So theoretically, he'll be back for 16. You always have to assume 
that he's going to, you know, that players are going to be healthy when you, when you're ranking them, because that's just kind of what you have to do. But at least he has a track record of, you know, he's not Ben Roethlisberger, which we'll be getting into in, in a minute here when we talk about Juju Smith Schuster. But so Stafford is generally remarkably consistent from a games played perspective. The fact that Kenny Galladay finished as a sixth best wide receiver with David Blau and Jeff Driscoll throwing him balls for for eight weeks. Oh, is, wow. Yeah. Um, it might as well be David Blow. I think that that <laughs> might be more accurate. So, I, you know, after him finishing at six last year, we we have him there this year. And which is kind of punting a little bit. If, you know, if if he only the, the fact that he finished that high with 29th in receptions and 20th in targets is is a testament to that touchdown production. But if those numbers stay the same of all the people we've talked about so far, he's the one that you could see fall off the most. If if those targets and receptions don't get bumped up, our assumption is, is that they will get bumped up once Stafford's back. Yeah, I uh, I think that when Stafford was gone, <laughs> I think <laughs> I <laughs> I think. I think I think Kenny Galladay had some David Bilal balls. <laughs> okay, all right. Woo! Sorry, that was a pun. That was a dirty pun for you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I I was holding that in. For 30 seconds waiting for you to finish so I could get that out of me because I had to get it into the world. All right. Ironic that you were holding it in. <laughs> I was trying so hard. Okay. Welcome to the fantasy oh, football boy. sackos. Uh-uh. It's the analysis, it's that hard hitting <laughs> <laughs> analysis. <laughs> Long-time <laughs> listeners that they so much enjoy. Ah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, Alex, you all right? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to recover. Lock it up. Lock it up. <laughs> All right. Con- <laughs> consensus. Wide receiver seven. Whew. Juju Smith Schuster. My wide receiver six on the season. Alex's wide receiver nine. I think that there's a very obvious tier here. Um, you go from the guys with not a whole lot of questions into the guys that are like, man, there's some. Really some glaring stuff here, whether or not they're going to be able to be successful at the same extremely high level. And yeah, for and, Juju, and these, it's can he get back to 2018? Yeah. So last year, 66th overall wide receiver, oh. 60, 61st in, this is crazy, 61st in receptions, 61st in yards, 61st in targets, and he had three touchdowns. Oof. But in 2018, to your point, he had 111 catches, 1,400 yards, seven touchdowns, and 166 targets, which is which is the fourth best, the fourth best in football. Easy for me to say in 2018. And so, you know, if you're just taking those stats, he would have been wide receiver two last year. Yep. So, so ceilings there, but he sucked last year. And well, so the offense sucked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it did. But is it is it because of quarterback play? Because yes, because well, I agree with you. But Kenny Galladay finit was fine. He he wasn't great, but he was still able to like support getting up to being a top ten wide receiver. Juju Smith Schuster didn't do anything. So can you? There's a couple different things. Can you count? Kenny on Galladay had David Bilal throwing the ball. Juju, Juju Smith Schuster didn't. I. Yeah, but so come on now. So Big Ben 
has been in Pittsburgh since 2004. In 16 seasons, he's played 16 games four times. Um, I don't, I don't know if he can stay healthy. He's getting old. And do you, when Juju Smith-Schuster was really good in 2018, he had Antonio Brown on the field at the same time as him. And Antonio Brown was taking the generally the number one quarterback cornerback and, or had safety health over the top. And so that freed up Juju to do a lot of things. Now that he's the number one guy and there's nobody else that's, you know, pulling coverage to away from him and maybe DeAndre Deontay Johnson, I believe uh, their wide receiver too, is, is going to be set up for a good year. If, if Juju Smith-Schuster is, is taking all those, taking all the attention. So it comes down to, do you think that he can revert back to his form in 2018? You think that's a better possibility than I do. Yeah, I do. Um, consensus seven overall, he's going a lot lower than that in drafts. And so the value is going to be there for Juju. I mean, I'm seeing his ADP getting him down in the fifth round. Like, this is a guy who could be a wide receiver one that you can get in the fifth round right now. Uh, for comparison's sake, ESPN's draft sheet has him as the 12th best wide receiver in 26 overall, which is I'm surprised they have him that high. Honestly, I'm surprised that they have him at 12. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on consensus. Mike Evans, number eight. Uh, we both actually have him at eight overall. Um, how, why don't you tell me about his uh, season last year? So do you want to talk about him and Godwin Godwin at the same time? Cause we have them right next to each other and it's, it's really just a toss up here yeah. as to, as to what we think is going to happen. So for comparison's sake, Mike Evans was 13th last year. Chris Godwin was second. So Chris Godwin was better last year. We currently have Mike Evans ranked ahead of, of Godwin. Mike Evans, 24th in receptions, 12th in yards, 22nd in targets, eight touchdowns. When you talk about Chris Godwin, 11th in receptions, third in yards, 17th in targets, and nine touchdowns, which is tied for third among wide receivers. So from a target perspective, there was only five spots separating them. Mike Evans was 22nd. Godwin was 17th. And Mike Evans was hurt a couple games uh, at the end of last year, and so was Godwin. So when you're talking about apples to apples, I would say they're relatively similar. So why why do we have Mike Evans above Chris Godwin? Uh, it's a good question. It's it's mostly my fault, actually. It's it's not well, you sense. don't though. You have Godwin above Evans in your individual rankings. I have Evans above Godwin in my. Oh, sorry. Yes, correct. So it's really just kind of how the numbers and averages worked out for everybody else around him. Yeah. We both have them all back to back. Uh, you just have them flip flopped. Yeah. I mean, Mike, Mike Evans had the fewest catches of, of his career last year, which is 67. Uh, That's every, uh, every Right. It's so low. Uh, this is going to be his seventh year in the league. He's had a thousand yards every single season in his career. Yep. Every year so, for the last six years. So every, you know, as for comparison's sake, there were 25 wide receivers that had over a thousand yards last year. So assuming that he's going to have over a thousand yards again, he has this really high floor. Uh, and that's why I think he's going to be better than Chris Godwin. Yep. Um, and, and we could talk about this. So consensus at number eight is Mike Evans. Consensus number nine is Godwin. I'm not really sure. You can rank them in whatever order you want. I mean, Godwin isn't going to be in the slot. It'll be interesting to see Brady having to throw it to the outside to these guys, you know, and getting away from that slot receiver that he had in Edelman last year. I would be a little bit concerned about it if I hadn't seen uh, what Brady and Randy Moss did in the past. And I so I know that he can get it to the outside receiver. And I know that he can throw it down the field. Brandon, that was also, was, I was going to say that was several ago. years ago. Yeah. So can, that's, that's the question is how long can Brady throw the ball for, you know? 
How how long can TB12 keep that uh that magical diet going going for to keep him on the field? That's but. a good question. And and Gronk's there and OJ Howard's there. Yeah, right. And so he, Cameron Brady, Brady too. Right. And, and Brady traditionally has thrown to tight ends considerably uh, a good amount when he has two really good tight ends, CC uh Gronk and Aaron Hernandez. I I don't know if I'm going to have either of these guys on any of my teams just because of the way that it might break down. I, I don't know if I trust Tom Brady to, you know, he's getting old, new offense. Is he going to be able to throw the ball down the field? Does it bring back those flashbacks of Peyton Manning when he was on Denver? But he was still able to support uh, Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders, e- even though that arm strength went away. If the arm strength does go away, is Bruce Arians smart, smart enough to tailor an offense where craziness just isn't happening all the time? There's a definite step up between Jameis Winston and Tom Brady in, in our, you know, I would say in both of our opinions. Uh, so Mike Evans, for that reason, theoretically would be able to be more consistent. I know he wasn't quite as consistent as he, as he historically has been, but Mike Evans has that like he'll just go off for a game and then he, he might kind of settle down. Whereas Godwin was really the more consistent one last year. So it yeah. disrupts the point I was just making, but I, I feel like Evans is, is a proven commodity. He's done it for six years. Chris Godwin, he's done it one year and ultimately it comes out to Kenny do it again. Last year, Mike Evans had 118 targets. Chris Godwin had 120. Last year, Mike Evans had six single point games. Chris Godwin had three single point games. So, I mean, these guys are right next to each other. Um, Mike Evans had some really disappointing games, though. I mean, he had the zero point game and he was on the field like 90 some odd percent of the time. It just had zero points. And then he, like the next week, he had 40. That's the that's the moralizing. Yeah. Oh, it's got incredibly frustrating, especially when he finds out that he's just healthy. And it's just Jameis not throwing him the ball. <laughs> yeah, let's not get one of our best playmakers the ball. Uh historically, Mike Evans, uh NFL history, he averages eighty uh yards a game, which is the sixth best all time. Wow. All right. Consensus number nine, Chris Godwin. Is there anything that you really want to add? Um, You can go through his stats. Yeah, again, second overall, 11th in catches, third in yards, ninth in touchdowns, uh, which is tied for third overall. With nine touchdowns. Yeah. Honestly, I don't really have anything to add. It's going to be up to you to determine which of these two guys that you want. And and maybe, yeah, I I just don't know if he's going to be able to repeat what he did last year. People know him now. They're they're going to be keying on him. But again, how can you key on him and Mike Evans and Gronk and OJ Howard and yeah. all of those weapons? So I, I don't know. But I we, we have him here. ESPN has him ranked sixth. Uh, they have Mike Evans ranked seventh. So they're right next to each other. Uh, both Same in as rankings and, and, and ADP um, at 13 and 14. Yeah, I think. I think the Bucks might lead the league in percentage of their plays ran with 12 personnel. And yeah, no uh, doubt. I well, for the people that don't know what uh what that means, um the numbers 1 and 2 refer to the number of running backs and the number of tight ends on the field. And then the rest, the numbers is is the number of receivers that are on the field. So, it would the number 12 would be one running back and two tight ends, which would mean that there are uh, what two tight end, or two receivers on the field. <clears throat> right. Which is, which is Evans and Godwin and that it should be an explosive offense as long as Brady can get the ball down the field, which Mike Arians likes to, uh, sorry, Bruce Arians likes to, likes to chuck the ball down, down the field. So. Yep. You got a little, a little excited to talk about Mike McCarthy Ooh. and our consensus. I did. Number 10. Amari Cooper. I have him at 10 overall. You have him at 11. Yeah. uh, Amari Cooper was, as my spreadsheet freaks out, Amari Cooper was the ninth best wide receiver last year. 
15th in receptions, 7th in yards, 18th in targets. He had eight touchdowns, which is tied for 7th. He was seems like he's hurt every year, but the production, like when I actually saw that he was ninth overall last year, I was I was a little surprised. Um, other than Mike Evans, potentially, he seems to me like he's one of the bigger boomer bus wide receivers in the NFL. Uh, as an example, in week five last year, he had 34 points and the next week he had one catch for three yards. And that's really tough when he's going in, you know, even when you're watching on a, on a given Sunday, he was going in and then he was coming out and staying on the sidelines and he was going back in for a couple of plays and he'd be back yeah. out. And, and so it's just like he is in fantasy. It's like, can you really trust this guy where, where Michael Gallup was almost the more consistent well, let's receiver talk about that too. Yes. Yeah. So and Amari, so, Amari yeah. had six single point games Oof. and in two of those six single point games, granted Gallup was hurt and missed time. So he wasn't on the field for uh, all the games that Amari ended up with single points. But in two of those six single point games, Gallup had double digit points, including one where he had 20 points. So it's yeah. like, is Gallup taking away from Amari? And Dak, like, is it some, this game is an Amari game? That game is a Gallup game? Would you rather and, have Gallup and at the ADP that you can get Gallup at and not have to draft Amari this high? Right. And now you have to worry a little bit about CD Lamb. Right. However, however, I do trust Mike McCarthy. He does have a history of number one wide receivers and making yeah. sure that they're kind of getting fed. So you look back to Greg Jennings and his broken freaking leg and, and Jordy Nelson and Devonte Adams, who, you know, like we just talked about was the number three wide receiver uh, two years ago when, when McCarthy was still there. So he has a history of doing it. Ultimately it's kind of a guess. Do you think it's going to be Cooper? Do you think it's going to be Gallup? Um, but Mike McCarthy's never had this amount of weapons on his team ever. And I think he'll be able to figure out how to get the ball to his best players. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so much agreeing this episode. I, yeah, I don't sorry. Know if I like it. Um, all right. Consensus. Robert Woods at number eleven. Consensus number eleven. I have him at eleven overall. Alex has him at thirteen. This is, I, I think, where the the agreeing might be over. Is you have um, you have Cooper Cup at ten. And Robert Woods at 13. So. I do. I do. And I know you're going to come at me a little bit with this. Um, just to recap real quick, uh, ESPN has Amari Cooper at 13th. Uh, best wide receiver, we have him at 10. Uh, for Robert Woods, uh, last year he was the 17th best wide receiver overall. He had the 8th most catches in football, 14th most yards. He was 8th in targets. And he only had two touchdowns, which is not much. Those so, touchdown numbers, that's what killed Robert Woods. So theoretically, he's due to have that touchdown progression, as I will be calling it. Uh, him only having those two touchdowns is criminal. I trust Jared Goff. Let me repeat, I do trust Jared Goff. Uh, he was one of the better quarterbacks in fantasy a couple of years ago. For whatever reason, it didn't happen last year. So I, I do have Cooper Cup in front of Robert Woods in, in my personal rankings um, before you kind of I'll let you riff on on Rob Rob here in a second. From, from my mind, for like the reason why I have Cooper Cup so high is because I feel like Brandon Cooks really bit into Cooper Cup more than he did Robert Woods. And so even at the end of this season, when when Higby was coming on, you know, Cooper Cup's uh, his snaps decreased his target percentage decreased because Brandon cooks was still on the field with Brandon cooks gone. Cooper cup is going to be on the field all the time. Uh, so Cooper cup was 11th in targets last year. Um, Robert Woods with eight was eighth in targets. So essentially the same and Cooper cup was paint was playing a lot less than Robert Woods. I always feel like Cooper cup has been uh, Jared Goss kind of security blanket ever since he started in the NFL more so than Robert Woods is. Uh, so 
Yeah, Cooper Cup, he makes an offense go. He was uh, the fourth ranked, fourth best overall wide receiver last year was Cooper Cup. Robert Woods was 17th. And so I don't think you can discount that. Cooper Cup has generally performed. And so I don't really understand why he's being considered a wide receiver two this year when he's proven that he's he can be a wide receiver one, and he did last year. Um, for a point of reference, ESPN has Cooper Cup as the 21st best wide receiver, and that's ridiculous. That he is was four. He was four overall last year. Robert Woods was 17th. I think that trend continues, and I think Cooper Cup is the better option of the two uh, Rams wide receivers. But I, I think that that offense can support both of them pretty pretty handily. Yeah, I think that they will certainly both finish at wide, as wide receiver twos or better. I don't think that there's a whole lot of question there. I think 21 is probably low for Cup. Um, but I'll tell you why why things changed. And it's because the offense changed. Um, the Rams ran 11 personnel, which is one running back, one tight end, 88% of the time in 2018, and 79% of the time in 2017, which by far was the most in the league in both seasons. Um, right. So just, just for clarification purposes, that means Robert Woods... Brandon Cooks and Cooper Cup are on the field. Right. Because that's you know, three, it, it, a three it, wide receiver set. Correct. Now, in 18, it worked. And it worked beautifully. And they won a whole heck of a lot of football games. Um, and in 19, teams started figuring it out a little bit. And they got off to, a, I think, sort of a disappointing start to the season um, in, in dropping some losses and some football games. Now. The reason that there was a 10% drop between 18 and 19 in 11 personnel is because they went from running 11 personnel 80% of the time in weeks uh, 1 through 10 down to just 58% of the time in weeks 11 through 17 last year. And they, they switched to 12 personnel. So you bring that extra tight end, tight end onto the field. You have Woods on one side, Cooks on the other, and Cooper Cup is chilling on the sideline. So now that's why Cooper Cup went down in scoring. And then coincidentally over that same time, um, Higby, Tyler Higby, the tight end that came on. Well, your first new, there was Higby. Your new lover. That first there was Higby. Well, there was Higby and Everett and they were sharing time, but then Everett got hurt and he missed the rest of the year. <coughs> and uh, Higby went off. But in the stretch from weeks 11 to 17, after they changed the offense to try and make it less stagnant and you bring that extra tight end on the field, Robert Woods benefited and he went from wide receiver 29 through week 10 to wide receiver eight from weeks 11 through 17. Cooper Cup, on the other hand, uh, it was still good, but he wasn't as amazing as he was. He was wide receiver six through week 10, and he, he dropped to wide receiver 16 from weeks 11 to 17. So Woods out-targeted Cup 68 to 43 in this span, and it also came with Woods missing a game. So to me, if, if that's the way that the offense is going, and we're talking about Tyler Higby breakout season. And if we, we can talk about these Higby stats real quick too. So Tyler Higby's weeks 11 through 17 stats, or excuse me, 13 through 17 stats. Once he became the full-time starter after Everett went down. And the Rams six, were basically eliminated from the playoffs. Well, I mean, they were still playing the games, but yeah, yeah I know. And Tyler Higby weeks 13 through 17 as a 16 game season, 179 targets, 138 receptions, more than 1,600 receiving yards, six and a half touchdowns, 275 fantasy points at, and half PPR, which is wide receiver two. Like as a tight end, as a tight end. So I understand why people are are uh, a little excited about Tyler Higby's prospects this year, and they do have Everett back. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if that hurts Higby's production, but. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I have Woods over Cup is because I feel like there was a shift in the offense in week 11. And it brought right, Cup off the field. But then you also got rid of Brandon Cooks. Right. And so now Cup will come back on the field. But instead of playing in the slot where he was so dangerous, he's going to be playing outside. And Brandon Cooks was never really great on that side of the field. It would be interesting if, I guess, where they line up. Like, do they leave Robert Woods on the same side of the field that he was on? Or do they bring him over to the play the Brandon Cooks role and they put Cup where Woods was? Sure. But I, and off the top of my head, I think I read this, that Brandon Cooks has been a top 15 wide receiver every year or like for the last five years, last year being the first year, he was not a top 15 wide receiver. And so even when they were all three of them were on the field at the same time, two years ago, they were all top 24 wide receivers, which is incredible. Yeah. And so, you know, now that cooks is gone, that does. And I, I get the Higby love, but I mean, Brandon Cooks had 42 catches, 583 yards, 72 targets. So even if you just take that and give it to Higby, like Cooper Cup can still repeat what he did last year. And that was wide receiver four. I just don't understand why, why he, or ESPN as a 21st ranked wide receiver. No love. Uh, and so I, I think they're very close, you know, to your point. I, I, I just think Cooper Cup was more consistent. And has been more consistent when he stayed healthy. And Jared Goff has shown that he prefers throwing to Cooper Cup more than he does Robert Woods, at least to this point in their careers. Whether that stays the same, I don't know. Uh, except for weeks 11 through 17 when Woods out targeted Cup 68 to 43. But never mind. Right, because he wasn't on the field. True. True. All right. Last but certainly not least, somebody no. I think we. We might have too low. But yeah, maybe. we might have screwed this up. You think he screwed it up? It's possible. Consensus number 12, DJ Moore. Carolina. Yo, yo, DJ. Is that my DJ? Oh, wow. All right. Well, we're keeping the singing going. <laughs> what, what an episode. <laughs> All right. DJ Moore, 18th ranked wide receiver overall last year. Uh, which, hey, second year wide receiver, pretty good. 18th overall. Uh, he was 10th in catches, 8th in yards, 10th in targets, and he only had four touchdowns. So, again, you're looking at TD progression, potential, you know, you, you got Teddy B thrown on the ball instead of Kyle Allen. To say it was just a bad, good receiver on a bad team that lost a lot of games, didn't score a lot of points. Hello, four touchdowns. Yeah, I I don't have. <laughs> I'm afraid to say too much about him because people listening to this will take will draft him in front of me and it will make me angry if if they're in my league. But I, I think DJ Moore has a top five potential provided those touchdowns are there. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at it, his numbers are, you know, comparable and or better than Chris Godwin's were. Um, as a second year wide receiver. And you saw what Chris Godwin did last year, which was become the number two wide receiver. And I think DJ Moore has that upside. Uh, I trust Teddy Bridgewater more than Kyle Allen. We have him at 12. ESPN has him at nine. So the hype, the hype is rolling on him. And you are going to have to, uh, to some some extent, potentially reach based on what he's done historically. Well, you're gonna have to spend up to get him, right? You're you're gonna have to take him in the second round in order to get DJ Moore on your team, and which hope he some, calls you in the second if you want him. Yeah, which it's it's DJ Moore, but, yeah. So it's not a sexy name, no. But it, but it could be a very sexy name. Could be, but it's not right now. But. He had three single digit games if you throw out week 17 when he got concussed. So to give you an idea over how good that is. Um, that's crazy. That's crazy low and, and DeAndre, very consistent. DeAndre had four single point games. Kenny Galladay had six single point games. Juju. I mean, we don't need to talk about Juju's here. 
Uh, Mike Evans had six single point games and he had one more at 10 points. So that's really seven or half of Mike Evans season, basically. Uh, Chris Godwin only had three single point games, but he did have two more at 10 points. Um, Amari had six single point games. So DJ Moore was incredibly consistent with only three single digit games. If you throw out the game that he got hurt. Sneaky. Yes. And then you put in Teddy Bridgewater, who had a 68% completion percentage filling in for Drew Brees last year and had a nine to two touchdown to interception ratio. And then you put in Matt Rule, who I think could be a very good coach. And DJ Moore, I mean, this could be a really good team. And DJ Moore could have a really excellent year. Um, it's just all the all the question marks put together. And will this actually end up being a good team? Like, will they be able to stay in games? And will they be, will they be able to move the ball? Those are the questions. Um that are keeping DJ Moore a little bit lower for us. Still a wide receiver one could be excellent. Just uh, not, not in the top. Need to answer some of those questions to get to really get up there. Yeah. The, the potential is there. And, and just one comment on Teddy Bridgewater. So last year is 68% completion percentage for the saints. Um, but as Minnesota's quarterback, uh, that completion percentage uh, for his years in, in Minnesota was, was just about 65%. So he's always been relatively accurate from, from that, per, you know, perception and DJ Moore is just like, he's a, he's just only six feet tall, which is about average for wide receivers at this point. He's 210 pounds and he catches everything. He does. He does. I, think he has, I think he has three career drops. And if, if you, you know, his route running is really good. I just specifically remember watching him in a game from London where he was just destroying somebody because he could get wherever he wanted to. And generally for wide receivers, that third year is usually the year that they really take a leap. Um, and this is his third year. So it's kind of all in alignment for, for him to have a jump. Again, he was 18th overall last year. ESPN has him at, as their ninth best wide receiver. We have him at 12. You're, you're going to have to pay to get him. Yeah. Yep. With that, thank you guys for listening to our Wide Receiver Ones episode. We will encourage you all to please consider uh, liking, subscribing to us on YouTube. Uh, tell please, us how right we are. Yeah, tell us how right we are. Tell us who who, who are we too high, too low on. And uh, please do visit our brand spanking new website, www.thefantasyfootballsackos.com for all of our rankings and so much more goodness. Um, we're going to be putting out a ton of articles uh, where our rankings, our podcasts are all there. Everything's hosted beautifully. Uh, it's a work in progress. We're still trying to get a, a lot of content up for you guys, but uh, check it out. It's been, it's been fun. It's been this whole venture <laughs> has really been fun from start to finish so far, but we're, we're that, making it. We're it's real. It's real. It's there. It's a website nine, you can go to. Nine episodes. I feel like we did good this time. We did great. And with that, have a good night, everyone. See ya.